So our next presenter here is Joanne Zingo. Joanne is a lifelong dancer who has studied belly dance with master instructors in the United States as well as in Morocco and Egypt. And she's here today to teach us about the history and music of this beautiful dance form and she'll even teach us some basic moves. So I'll turn it over to Joanne. I'm not sure if you're speaking yet, Joanne, but we can't hear you if you... Well, apparently I was muted. I think I should be okay now. I can hear you now. Okay, and is the music okay or is it too loud? I hear it just faintly. Okay, good, because I don't want it to drown me out. So, welcome to How To Belly Dance. Um, boy, this is... A half an hour doesn't even do it justice, so I'm going to try to tell you a little bit about belly dance, which I view as an art form and an equal in dance to many other styles that we're familiar with. A little bit of history, a little bit of health benefits, and how to. So, how did it all begin? Well, maybe during the time of the pharaohs, as you can see by these illustrations, um, acrobatics or contortion, juggling, and couples dancing and doing feats of strength. So more Cirque du Soleil, circus-like kind of things going on, but not, not what we think of as dancing or belly dancing. From a historical perspective and generally speaking, music and dance develop as countries go to war, whether we like that or not, and win or lose, the cultures meld. So you can see this map of, and there's so much more, but this map of where there was a lot of activity, probably from about 1500 BC through the fall of the Roman Empire in 400 AD or thereabouts. And there were many changes in power across North Africa, on the Arabian Peninsula, People from Egypt came up and conquered up into Iran and Persia. Just a lot of activity. And every time that that happened, something got shared. Uh, in the case of Greece, um, mathematics, and then mathematics in music. So really, really interesting stuff if you dive into it. The most well-known, I think, is probably the Moors' conquest and rule in Spain from 711 to 1492. And it was called Al Andalus, and you'll sometimes hear Andalusian this or that. It certainly is known as the home of flamenco, flamenco music and flamenco dance. And guess what? These are related. And also um, the Alhambra is a prime example of Moorish architecture beautiful place. I got the opportunity to see it a couple years ago. And so the lasting influences from a cultural perspective include instruments. So the, the wooden lute, L-U-T-E, in Arabic is called al-ud, O-U-D, and it means wood. And it was oud before it was oud, just as an example. And the rhythm, and even the forms of dress, if you look at my little picture here, you can see that some of this form of dress uh, is retained today in North Africa for men. Not a lot of information um, when you wanted to find documentation in the early 18th century or late 18th century and early 19th century. The owners, if you will, or landlords of the countries in North Africa went there to look. I want to see what their property consisted of, what kinds of things they could take and export back to their homelands. Um, so the texts that uh, I was able to find in my early research were in German, Dutch, 
and French. Um, I could work my way through the French and not much else. So this picture is actually of a, a wedding procession. You can see the dancer is doing a cartwheel. So still some of that acrobatic stuff going on. Of interest, and I have a reference page at the end of this presentation that a young Florence Nightingale traveled on the Nile River in 1849 and 50 and made observations about what she saw, what she thought of the people, how, how her hosts interacted, etc. So formalizing this style, really um, the Egyptian style of dance was first recorded in the 1930s. Um, and composers of the golden age, and this man pictured as Muhammad Abdel Wahab. There are other famous composers of that time, um, Halim Abdel Hafez and um, Farid Al Atrash, are very well known. The first nightclubs opened in Cairo. If you go to Egypt today and you want to see a belly dancer, you go to a nightclub. You might see them in your hotel but that's the place to see the most famous dancers. And Badia Masabni sort of created a dancers union. Dancers were performing in the streets until then. They really didn't get on a stage very often. And it was her idea to bring these musicians and composers and these dancers together on a stage. And she opened a, the Casino Opera House in Cairo. And some of the Famous dancers of the golden age of belly dance in Egypt also performed there. So, how did it get here? In 1892, at the Chicago Exposition, there were musicians and a dancer. The dancer was known as Little Egypt. And Little Egypt, okay. Stop that for a moment. Yeah, I'm good, I'm glad. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Let me stop my music here. Okay. Um, I'm gonna see if I can get this video to run. It's uh, it's common, commonly used, so let's see. Can you see this screen or do I have to reshare? It looks like. Um, I'm seeing your PowerPoint presentation. Um, okay. Let me but go in and not a uh, discreet. Okay. All right. So this is film that Thomas Edison made of one of three dancers who became known as Little Egypt. She was at the 1892 exposition and also 1893. This film, as you can see, was made in 1896. There is no sound, of course, because it's the old... Uh, kinescope type of film. But you can see that she's playing finger symbols and she's wearing coins on her hips and she also has some draped across her chest. Now this version is what happened after people saw the original one. It was censored because somebody thought that this was not a good thing for most people to see. So, and this, uh, this original film, by the way, is at the New York Library. Okay, if you, but you can find it online easily enough. Um, it's one of several films of Little Egypt, and it's only that one minute long. Let me go back to my screen share and come back. Back into our presentation. Okay. The other thing that got people in the America excited about belly dance was the discovery of King Tut's tomb in 1922. We're still seeing your computer screen as opposed to your PowerPoint. Oops. Is it unpaused? It says it's paused. Resume share. How about now? Looks good now. All right. Sorry about that. So. As you can see, there's Tutankhamun. They found his tomb in 1922. It was really ravaged by looters once it was originally found. But it, in any event, it, uh, it got people's attention. 
And if you look at some of the flapper dresses from the 1920s, you'll see a, a fabric known as Assuit, A-S-S-U-I-T, or Tuli Bitelli, and it's a black, um, well, sometimes it's white, but it's a, uh, it's got silver threads woven in it. I'm wearing an imitation of that today um, that you'll see when I do the actual demonstration. Also, uh, modern dancers picked up on the style. So this small photo down here is Ruth St. Dennis, who um, she partnered with uh, Dennis, with, um, what was his first name? Sean, but the Dennis Sean Modern Dance Company. And this was part of her, um, part of her presentation. And here's a photo looking very much like a belly dancer, okay? And then movies dramatize the look of a belly dancer. Um, Claudette Colbert, Cleopatra, Hedy Lamarr, and Samson and Delilah. Um, the Dance of the Seven Veils is performed by Rita Hayworth. So it started to come up in the movies. And I want to take a brief break right now to say, happy summer solstice. It's happening. This is the minute. All right, I'm going to go back into the presentation. And belly dance today. There was a wave of interest in the 1970s. Uh, you could say all us hippies decided it would be a cool thing to do. Um, I'm not really sure what got it started. I do know that there was a woman in California and a gentleman in New York, and they were teaching classes, and people were interested in getting involved for many reasons, as you see here, as a hobby, as exercise, because they wanted to have performance opportunities. And then friendship. I can't tell you, uh, in the years since I first took a belly dance class at the Y in this late 70s through today, I've met so many wonderful people around the world and made a lot of lasting friendships. Well, what kind of health benefits can you get from belly dance? Stretching, which, you know, any, any kind of dance, if, when you're stretching, it helps with your posture and your breathing. Muscle control is a function of mind over matter. As we get further into the techniques, you have to sort of set yourself up with um, kinetic pathways so that your body knows what to do. I talk about a shimmy being on automatic pilot. Belly dance is a low impact but a weight-bearing exercise, and it's suitable for all ages. I'm going to testify I will be 70 this year. Isolation of particular muscle groups defines the shape of signature movements. So when you lift your upper body and make a circle, that's an isolation. Attention to posture strengthens the spinal column and the abdominal muscles. It improves overall flexibility through your torso and spine. And focus on detail is great brain exercise. When we're working with props like veils and canes, that helps to build upper arm strength. And also playing finger symbols, get your fingers working independently so it's another kind of coordination. It's kind of like a tongue twister for your hands. I don't know how else to describe it. So here are those references. Um, and a copy of this uh, presentation is available at the library. Melissa has it. So if you're interested, you can contact her or you can contact me, gazea at AOL.com. And you'll see that I teach classes for the last carnival. Right now I'm teaching online classes for um, intermediate and advanced students only. And the reason for that is I believe that beginning students need to be in the room, in person, so that everybody can really see what's going on and that I can see what you're doing. I don't feel responsible as an instructor if I can't guide you to doing the movements properly. So, gosh, let's move. It's easy to learn, but difficult to master. The basic movements are not that difficult. And they are kind of easy on the body. What makes it difficult is perfecting the movements and then putting them all together. So we're going to start at the beginning. If you're not already standing up, stand up. 
I am going to switch to my camera, hopefully. So let me see, I believe I'm gonna have to stop sharing. And I need my camera. Any thoughts on that? Start video? Uh, yeah, start video. There you go. Video. Oh, there I am in the little corner, and here I am. All right, I'm gonna make an adjustment. So this is that design of the fabric I talked about, the S suit, but it's actually, um, this is actually on, on a, a fabric. It's not woven in like the original. All right, so we have some nice music here. Just to kind of run in the background. I'm gonna back up and so that you can see, I guess I'm kind of shiny. I don't usually get dressed up. I got dressed up for you, okay? I'm going to back up just a little tiny bit so that you can see all the way to the floor. The first thing in any kind of dance is your posture. So I saw I saw an interesting little video and it says the first thing is to stand up and the next thing is to walk and everything else is elaboration. So when you stand, you want your feet to be under your hips, not under this part of your hips, but find your pelvis. Put the heel of your hand on your pelvic bone and ride down the front of your legs until you find your toes. And that's toes pointed forward. The next thing is you want there to be a little bit of a bend in your leg, not a whole bunch, just a little bit. What happens when you do that, okay, if, I think you can see this. If my legs are straight, my tuchus is up. But if my legs are bent, my sacrum drops it down. So I have like a flat back. That's a release of tension and musculature in your back that allows you to move more easily, all right? So your knees are slightly bent. And now think about stacking your skeleton on top of your body. So shoulders over rib cage, over hips, over knees, over feet. So if you think about the uh, the skeleton hanging in the classroom. Does that straight up and down? The next thing now is to add some musculature. So we want to work with the trapezius muscles in our back. I don't want you to pull your arms back, pop your chest up, but those are the muscles. Think about if from your shoulders you made a V. You use your muscles to pull down into a V. And so what that does is it lowers your shoulders. So your shoulders are up. And the next thing is to put your hand right here on your chest and lift it slightly. Once you've made the V in the back, this lift will happen. And a friend who talks about this being your heart open. And in belly dance, your heart is open when you dance. It's very rare that you close yourself off to your audience. You're expressing your own joy in the music and in the dance, all right? Now, now that we have all that <laughs> put aside, let's move, okay? First of all, let's just roll those shoulders back. In a normal class, I would have some stretches to get you ready. And roll your shoulders forward. So it's just little shoulders, and think of this as a stretch, it's not a dance move, okay? All right, and then spread your feet apart for a minute, bend your knee and reach your arm up and stretch all the muscles in the side of your body, and then do the other side. So make sure the stretch is going up and down from your armpit to the floor, up and down. Long, long stretch, one more time, long, long stretch. And now we get to find out if you remembered how you were standing. So let's go back to our perfect posture. Feet under hips, under ribcage, under shoulders, shoulders back and down. Knees are slightly bent. All right. Put your hands on your ribcage and take a breath. And when you take that breath, you can feel your ribcage lift. Now let the breath out and keep the ribcage lifted. You can keep your hands here if you like or move them down to the top of your leg. What you've done is created a frame so that you can see your movement. And reach your rib cage to one side and then to the other. If you're collapsed, 
this is hard to do. So you need to have that lift. And also, go back to that drop. Your knees bent and your hips drop down to the floor. And that allows you to move your rib cage. And first we're gonna go from side to side. And this is called a slide. Okay. We can also make a circle. To make a circle, think about a clock. And your body is the center of the clock. So you can go to three o'clock, nine o'clock, whichever. 12 o'clock, three o'clock, nine o'clock, six o'clock. So you go on side, front, side, back, side, front, side, back. And then you smooth it out. And you have a rib cage circle. Some teachers call it a chest circle, but it's really not your chest. It's not any muscles up in here making a circle. It's your rib cage floating around over your hips. And go both directions because I don't want to get dizzy. Yes, that's one of the jokes I make in class. All right. I'm going to check time here to make sure we have time to do all the good stuff. All right, we're in good shape. So I'm going to switch to hips now. We still want to have this lift from the rib cage and the shoulders down. So it's kind of like a compression, if you will, but it shouldn't feel like it, right? So, so your upper body is pulling down and back, and then your rib cage are lifting, is lifting up into it. So then you bend your knees and think like you're going to sit. All right, so I'm held up. I bend my knees like I'm going to sit, and it makes my sacrum drop. Uh, this is important to allow the movement, the isolation of your hips or your pelvis. So you're going to do the same idea, sliding, pushing your hips from one side to the other. When we do a circle with our hips, we want to be careful not to tilt our pelvis forward or back. That's the kind of move that you see in uh, hula or Tahitian dance, where this is tucked and the, the pelvis tucks forward. But in this, your pelvis stays flat. So if you think of this circle as being parallel to the ground, if you will, in all ways, and just like with the upper body, you're going to slide to one side, and then you're going to bring both hips forward at the same time. So think about bringing both hips forward at the same time. Then go to the other side and to the back. So you go side, front, side, back, side, front, side, back, side, front, side, back, side, front, side, back. Side, front. Side back. And then we go the other way. Side front, side back. Side front, side back. Side front, side back. Notice that my, my rib cage and my chest are staying still. So this is like the magic of belly dance and the part that makes you have to think because you got to hold this steady while this is moving underneath. We're going to do one more hip movement. Um, that we didn't do on the upper body because it's actually easier than the lower. It's called a figure eight. So think about the infinity symbol. It's ongoing. It's a continuous shape. It's the number eight. It's the infinity symbol. But think about if you took it and went flat. So it's parallel to the ground again. And you're going to make one loop and another loop. And one loop and another loop. We have our same lifted rib cage, dropped hips. We're going to start by twisting one hip forward. Once you twist this hip forward, you don't have to think about twisting again because it just happens. So now you're going to slide that hip and come around. So we used our slide and our circle to make this figure eight. Now we're going to slide and come around and slide and come around and slide and come around. Okay. 
the thing about this move is you'll feel your weight shifting. So when I bring my hip forward, I can feel the weight in my foot. And as I come around, it goes from the ball of my foot to my heel. In dance, we call this grounding. The movement is grounded because you're attached to the floor. And the movements in your hips are called earthy because they are grounded. And the movements in your upper body are called ethereal because they're lifted away. We're gonna do one more thing before we go because it's something everybody wants to do and it's a shimmy. I'm gonna face you and then I'll turn sideways because of the reflection of the uh, fabric. But you're going to start with both knees bent, both feet flat, hips, everything lined up, and you're gonna bring one quadricep back. And when you bring that back, the hip pops up. And then you're gonna switch sides. So you bring the other quad back. So you're going back, 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 back. We turn sideways so you can see the leg. Back, 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 back. Because you can't really see the hip from the side. But you can see the leg movement. The shimmy happens because you go faster, faster, faster. Okay, so back, 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 back. One and two and three and four. The faster the legs go, the faster the hips go. Contrary to popular belief, we call it a hip shimmy, but your hips are not active. And by the way, we call this belly dance, but I didn't ask you to do anything with your belly. And we are right up on our time. I want to thank you all for being with me today. I'm going to remind you that I am teaching at the last carnival. Uh, the studio has moved. It's, uh, it's off of Castle Drive in Western Lawrence. And intermediate and advanced students can take classes online or in the studio right now on Tuesday evenings. The plan is that in September, we will begin classes for beginning students. And I do look forward to seeing new students, bright, shiny faces in places. And uh, once again, thank you so much. I think there are a couple of questions maybe in the chat, Melissa. Yeah, thank you so much, Joanne. That was such a fun way to round out the How-To Festival. Um, we don't we don't have any questions right now in the chat oh. or in the Q and A. Um, must have been some must have been from a previous presentation. Okay. Yeah, some other things were going on, and we are right up on time. So. Um, well, I have been known from years at the Renaissance Festival to start late and close on time because it's what we do. Yeah. Well, Thank great. you again for having me, and uh, hopefully some people are interested, and we'll be in touch with you and grab the information. Yeah, and someone does say that they had fun dancing. Yay! That's <laughs> the idea. I tell my students, if you didn't have a good time and you don't feel like you accomplished anything, I missed, I missed my mark because not only is it great to learn, it should be fun to learn. So thank you again, everyone. Thank you, Melissa, for this opportunity. Great. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.